Awesome. Well, welcome in everyone. We are so excited to have you join us this morning. Um, my name is Joey and I will be the uh, tech, your tech facilitator today. So if you have any Zoom issues, please uh, send them my way and I'll try and help you out a little bit. Um, finishing getting my uh, screen all set up. So I think we are good. Well, welcome. So this is Navigating the Housing System. Um, this is our second of four opportunities to attend this training. Um, we did it first back in December and we will offer it again sometime after October next year. If you have anyone who you want to join, um, next October will be their next opportunity. So I'm gonna quickly go through kind of who, who we are today um, as your host. So like I said, my name is Joey. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the education strategy specialist at Building Changes. Um, today I'm wearing a beige cardigan uh, and glasses, and my hair is uh, wavy and brown, um, and I identify as a white woman. And I will pass it off to my co-host. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. <laughs> go ahead. You go. <laughs> my, name, my name is Kayla Blau. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a writing consultant for Building Changes. I previously worked in um, the public school sector and at a domestic violence shelter, so I'm excited to be here with y'all today. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just love Zoom because there's just always quirks all the time. So um, so happy you're here with us today. My name is Sammy Iverson. I use she, her pronouns. Um, today, I am wearing a beige sweater. I have dark brown, almost black hair, and I identify as a Korean American woman. Um, happy again to see you all. All right, so I'm seeing a lot of good mornings in the chat and I love to see it. Um, I would also love if you could put in your name, um, your like where you're working, your role, and if you're comfortable sharing your pronouns. Um, also uh, in the next slide, um, while you're typing that in, I'm gonna pass it off to Kayla for our land acknowledgement and we can include that in your introductory chat as well. All right, so we would like to acknowledge the indigenous people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial and who still inhabit the area today. The building changes um, building is on the land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people. And for the context of this training, I'd just like to ground us in um, the history of the harms that not only the housing system, but also the public education system has inflicted on indigenous folks in this country and hold space for that intergenerational trauma that's passed down to the uh, students that we work with today. All right, we've been doing Zoom for a couple years now, but still a good to touch base on it. Um, so first things first, if you are here and hoping to get clock hours, um, please be sure that your name matches um, on Zoom, That to the name that you have in PD Enroller. Um, that is gonna be really important for you to get attendance credit and get those clock hours. Um, and you can change that by kind of hovering over your name, click your, your face, clicking on those three dots and changing your name. Um, please, you know, be sure to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, take, take care of yourself, take bio breaks as needed. Um, we will have a break in the middle of the session, but if you need to take care of something, please, by all means. Um, and there is a live transcript available, at least I believe. Uh, all right, so it is now available. Sorry, I didn't do that earlier. So if you um, would like to turn on the live transcript or if it automatically just turned on for you, um, you can uh, do that from the, the bottom of your screen kind of uh, next, there's that little menu arrow next to the closed caption button. Um, and you can choose from showing subtitles, full transcript or both you can adjust the size and you can also hide those subtitles. Um, please use the reaction buttons. Um, we love seeing those claps, those hearts, whatever it is in the corner, if you agree with something. Um, please raise your hand if you have questions throughout. And then um, also feel free to put anything in the chat. We're gonna try and answer it as we go. Um, we will pause for questions throughout. Um, 
and just know there's no such thing as a bad question. If you if you're wondering something, I'm sure somebody else is too. So please pop it in. All right, gonna pass it off to Sammy. All right, for the next couple of slides, um, just to get us started, we're gonna share a little bit about our organization as well as kind of how we came to um, be facilitating this training for you all today. Um, some of you may have heard of Building Changes before or maybe not. Um, just in case, uh, we are a nonprofit working with and alongside communities across Washington State um, to explore the intersections of systems serving young people, students, and families experiencing homelessness. Some of our work involves funding innovative ideas, providing technical assistance and training, um, project and program research and evaluation, um, and advocacy efforts that aim to change policies to strengthen implementation. Next slide, please. Um, so what we have here on the screen is our statement on racial equity. Um, we would like you all to know that Building Changes is committed to center racial equity internally and externally. Um, we bring a targeted universalism lens to our work. Um, that is a term coined by John A. Powell. And it really acknowledges equity rather than equality. Um, we no longer believe that everyone should receive the same level of support, but we believe in prioritizing the needs of those most marginalized. By doing so, there is a universal benefit. Um, to be clear, this is not about preference. This is about acknowledging that people are situated differently and have varying needs. Um, a simple example, one that I always kind of think about when we think about a, um, how targeted universalism plays out in our communities is ADA sidewalks. Um, we know those are built to accommodate wheelchairs, um, but those ramps also benefit your skateboarders, your strollers, um, and the wider community. And then for the next slide, thank you. Um, so this is an infographic that Building Changes put out, um, as you can see, and we're using this today to just center our students further from educational justice and to access um, resources and opportunities. We wanna kind of start out here. Um, we wanna acknowledge, excuse me, and my friend, my son in the background. Um, we wanna acknowledge that um, this work is specifically um, targeted to meet the needs of these particular students in this population. Um, and what we know, this is data from 2018, 2019, there are about 42,000 students experiencing homelessness in Washington state. We know that three quarters of that population are living doubled up, usually due to financial hardship with friends or family. And that also means that they will not qualify for mainstream housing resources. And as the infographic states, six out of 10 of those students are students of color. Um, our research at Building Changes has shown that those doubled up students have equally poor academic outcomes as their literally homeless peers, meaning housing stability is a key factor in furthering student learning and academic outcomes. Um, a key takeaway really from this slide is that our current system, if you are a student of color, you're living doubled up with your household, um, you are most likely not going to be eligible for resources to stabilize both your housing and your education. And this, is a, this is a serious problem. Um, so this is why our focus on equity and targeting strategies to serve students of color is absolutely vital in stabilizing our McKinney Vento population and really keeping that targeted universalism in mind, um, centering this student population will benefit all students. And moving on to the next slide, um, the last one that we have is just a little, a little bit on our team today. So um, you may have seen our work back in 2018, 2019. Um, we helped with the McKinney Vento training for all liaisons, both in Tacoma and I believe Yakima. Um, we've shown up in other spaces with OSPI as well. We've been in partnership for years and we're just excited to continue this work. Um, we will be providing seven total trainings through September 2023. Each of those trainings will be delivered four times. Um, we are today a mighty team of actually four, if we are including our um, amazing and incredible Kayla, who is um, joining us as a consultant. But um, our team at Building Changes is made up of Joey, myself, and our colleague, Marette, who um, is our team lead um, for our education work. And we just wanna share that we are super passionate about preventing and ending student homelessness. 
also supporting those who are advocating for those students at every angle that we can. Um, we've all worked directly with students in different capacities in our career, and we're just really feeling privileged to be able to share space with you today. Um, really the thinking behind this training is to offer overview as almost like a sampler of the housing system. You can have a sense of resources out there for students and families you're serving. Um, our hope today is that we will start at the system level and work our way down into services. And I'm gonna pass it off to Kayla. All right, so for our agenda today, we'll go ahead and do a mckinney Vento refresher, um, and then we'll go into that higher level um, housing uh, resources that Sammy mentioned. We'll have a quick break, and then we have a lovely Megan from Building Changes um, with some advocacy updates. And then we'll have a panel um, to provide space for a day in the life of a housing provider, as well as hopefully, um, some folks with lived experience will be able to join us and then we'll have some time for networking so we recognize that you all bring a wealth of knowledge um, and expertise as well um so some of the objectives are just um like sammy said to just provide a higher level overview of services available and walk you through some of the options available for families um, and also to provide updates on policies, especially in the midst of COVID-19 and how that's changed the way that we serve students experiencing homelessness. Um, and then for just like a quick refresher for McKinney-Vento, um, there are you know, trainings that go much deeper into this, but just for a higher level uh, reminder, McKinney-Vento is a federal law that um, protects the educational rights of students experiencing homelessness. And so that provides things like transportation to school and ensuring that they can stay in their uh, school of origin so that their education isn't interrupted by their bout of homelessness. Um, and anyone uh, who lacks a fixed, regular and adequate nighttime residence is eligible. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that even if, um, for example, if a student was staying in a shelter in um, September and then they got permanent housing in March, they would still be uh, eligible for McKinney-Vento services through actually through August of that school year, meaning that if they had to um, go to summer school uh, at that school or if they were involved in you know sports or different activities at the sc their school of origin, they have the right to continue at that school until the end of um, uh, end of August of that school year. Um, and also just to highlight, I see a question in the chat here. Um, refugees are uh, also eligible for McKinney-Vento services. We can touch on this um, you know, more in depth later, but it, it doesn't matter of what your immigration status is um, or uh, it's really just if you lack a fixed, regular or adequate nighttime residence. So if you're staying in a shelter, hotel, motel, in a car, um, doubled up with family or friends, uh, living in an RV. It's anywhere that is not, um, doesn't have access to water and heat or isn't, um, what is the wording that we use? Isn't a, like, it has inadequate accommodations. Um, so regardless of citizenship, citizenship status, then um, students are eligible if they don't lack that, or sorry, if they don't have that permanent um, nighttime residence. Um, so now we'll just uh, start breaking down the framework of the housing system. I'll pass it off to Joey. All righty. So if you have been in a training with us before, you know I love Mentimeters. They're so fun. So um, today's Mentimeter is um, this link should work. I realized I should have triple checked it earlier, but um, if you can either go to menti.com and type in that code at the top of the screen or um, follow the link in the chat and answer this question. It's a little wordy, so bear with us. Um, how knowledgeable do you feel about eligibility and accessing resources through your community's housing system for the students you serve? So you're like, kind of what's, what's, your, what's your knowledge, what's your comfort um, with the housing system in your community? And this should update as folks kind of add in there. Oop, there it is. I love it. All right, so we've got, looks like looking at the spell curve here, we got kind of a, a spectrum, which is exactly um, what we expect. We know that we have some, you know, probable experts in the room, and we also have folks who are much newer 
um, and don't know, or maybe not newer, but haven't worked with the housing system as much. All right, yep. Give it another second. We'll watch that, that bell curve bounce. It's so fun. All right. I'm going to click forward to the next slide. There will be plenty more Mentimeters to come, so um, you can leave that page up on your web browser or whatever it may be, um, and it will update as I click through. Okay, so the um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, aka HUD, uh, categories categorizes homelessness in these um, four categories that you see on the screen. And the thing that I want to lift up here is that it can get a little bit confusing because uh, McKinney-Vento law also includes students that are living doubled up. So what we mentioned before, if they're staying with an auntie or a cousin, um, a friend, and they don't, they aren't on the lease officially, then they would uh, qualify for McKinney-Vento through doubled up services. Um, and as Sammy mentioned, that's usually uh, the majority of the, the students that we work with are in that doubled up situation. It's really important that school staff understand this, um, this nuance here because I've worked with a lot of folks who have been turned away um, from McKinney-Vento services at the school level because they were told that because, you know, they're not literally homeless, like they're not in a shelter, in a car, or something like that, um, that they wouldn't qualify. So we just want to reiterate that under McKinney-Vento law, they do qualify for McKinney-Vento services if they're doubled up. All right. So again, just kind of as a grounding piece to understand um, maybe some of the resources households or students you're working with may be accessing. Um, this slide is really just breaking down um, what TANF is. I'm sure all of you are familiar or have heard about this resource in some capacity, um, what those letters stand for, or temporary assistance for needy families. Um, we just wanted to take a few minutes to think about um, really what households are experiencing when they're accessing this resource. Um, so your TANF benefits are based on your family size and your income. Um, they're usually um, allocated through your local DSHS or DCYF office. And um, just as an example, if you're a family of three um, without income, as well as assets, I think under $6,000 or less, um, you would receive a monthly TANF grant of $654. Um, what that is annually would be $7,848. Um, if you're participating in that program, um, it's, also, um, it's also an expectation for you to really kind of um, show up for maybe a work first program um, to consistently report in your income or any changes in it to your DCYF or DSHS caseworker. Um, and you also may qualify for other things such as health insurance for yourself and your children, um, as well as working connections, childcare, which would just mean if you were starting a job, um, DSHS would provide um, some sort of voucher or subsidy for your childcare. Um, with all that in mind, um, I want to go back to that annual income of $7,800. Um, people receiving this resource. Um, able to afford housing. Um, not only is it not affordable, um, oftentimes work first programs take up to eight hours a day. Um, the expectation is that you show up, you know, at the SHS office and do um, job searching for, you know, an entire day. And they may be helping with childcare. It doesn't, it doesn't give you a ton of other time outside of a regular workday um, to be searching for that housing or to be making um, a livable wage because you're you know receiving the benefit from from them um, this is just kind of an opportunity to understand the realities around um, what some of your the households you're serving are going through um, and i'm sure you all have worked with a family or heard of a family ex like on this benefit um, there's also kind of this tricky piece of um, letting go of your TANF because what it means is that you're losing your health insurance. You're also losing potentially your childcare. 
Um, it's referred to in the community when I worked in housing resources, it was really, we called it the benefits clip. So it's trying to make that decision of you know, how to sequence in time, um, how to let go of those benefits while also taking on work, while also factoring in childcare, as well as health insurance. Um, next slide, please. Um, another piece of other resource out there that I'm sure you all have also heard about are SNAP benefits, um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, or Basic Food. We've heard um, we've heard people refer to it to that as that as well. Um, I don't know if it's easy to see kind of what we've written on the slide. I know it's a little bit text heavy, but um, on the right side, you're going to see what you can and can't do with your EBT card. Um, and then on the left, we're just going to go into, again, that family of three without income, um, receiving TANF would also receive $511 a month um, in SNAP benefits. Um, here's some legibility details. Um, but what we wanna think about with that is, uh, if you are to receive this resource, there's some caveats to it as well. If we think about our doubled up population, um, potentially living with family or friends or living in a hotel motel situation. Um, what SNAP doesn't cover are any hot foods or any prepared foods in your grocery store. So if you needed to grab something quick for the family um, from the deli, um, say at your local grocery store, um, your SNAP benefits aren't going to cover that. Um, they are going to cover a variety of other things in the store, but what it means is that you'll need to be able to prepare your meals. Um, a lot of times hotel motel living doesn't have a full kitchen or offer any types of resources. So it just adds kind of that additional layer of um, stress on top of, you know, housing crisis itself. Um, you just don't really have that autonomy um, to make meals the way that maybe you had used to before receiving that benefit or before, um, you know, being in a housing crisis. So we just want to that um, to the table today when we're talking about um, you know, what housing crisis is and how it looks for households. And then just an additional note um, for immigrant families concerned about becoming a public charge. Um, as of March 2021, um, the U.S. excuse me, U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services Department um, is not considering an applicant's receipt of Medicaid um, public housing or SNAP assistance benefits as part of their citizenship determination. Um, so accessing these services should not impact the ability to gain citizenship. We wanted to just touch on that today as well. Um, we will provide a training in the future on how to serve special populations, specific populations, and would love for you to join us to go a little deeper with that. And then we're gonna make a transition now into um, coordinated entry. So now we're gonna kind of pivot to talk about some big pieces of the housing system and kind of what that looks like. So um, we're gonna drop a link um, that was put out by the Department of Commerce um, for any of you all to check out. Um, it's going to show you where your coordinated entry access points are in your community. Um, just a little tiny quick bit of history. Um, back when I was a housing provider in 2011, 2012, um, coordinated entry and this idea was just really coming through. So what, what used to happen is you would have a booklet of phone numbers, like, like a yellow pages, the phone book that we used to use, um, and you would go through it and call. Um, for on behalf of your family or clients you were working with. And oftentimes that, um, you know, took a lot of time. Um, there wasn't always resources and it would just be a ton of phone calls, um, a lot of work on the provider as well as on the family. So coordinated entry was then designed to help um, just develop a centralized point where you could go and they would help really field resources for you on behalf of your family and dependent on your situation. Um, so the purpose of coordinated entry is to provide the quickest access to the most appropriate housing to every household experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness. Um, and we want to drive home this really varies by community. Um, 
So it's usually multiple providers. Um, it had once started as one point, like one place to go to get resources. They realized that um, this, our systems realized that that wasn't really enough. So we needed to develop set, we needed to develop satellite sites and other ways to access those resources. Um, so in an intake with coordinated entry, if you're experiencing homelessness, um, a household would share their situation with an intake specialist, um, review services that may be helpful to them. And um, oftentimes these are not immediate. So we want that to also be known. Um, services are usually prioritized um, for the most vulnerable, um, such as chronic homelessness or people living with disabilities. Um, just for a little detail, chronic homelessness usually involves with being, um, experiencing homelessness multiple times within a certain time period or um, for a long period of time. And the next slide is going to be um, just a way to illustrate kind of maybe some of the complications and barriers that could come up. Um, if you are experiencing the housing crisis, you're hoping to access resources. So if we want to think about this um, landscape that you're seeing here um, and how it could be challenging to navigate. Um, just like this map, we have a peninsula, we have water, we have trees, we have roads. Um, this is just a simple example to show kind of the things that could come up as well as the complexities of the housing service system. Um, housing interventions are going to be listed in yellow, um, while other student and family needs are going to be in white. So just imagine, you know, you are showing up to get to your coordinated entry appointment, and then you're going to need to check in with a low-income housing provider. So you're going to also, between that time, have to drop your daughter off at school, um, maybe pick up some groceries, maybe drop your son off at child care. Um, when you have limited resources, limitations on transportation, um, this is a lot. Um, it's a lot to get done. It's a lot of different places that you need to be. And unfortunately, because resources are limited in our communities, that doesn't always, it's, there isn't a promise that that resource will come through. So um, as we know, this is, this is a little bit daunting, um, this is really the reality of our housing system. Um, unfortunately, um, it's just needing more resources and more investment to be able to meet what the actual needs are out there. Um, I'm going to now pass it off to Kayla. Thank you, Sammy. Um, so I'm not going to read through all of these that are on the screen, but um, I just wanted to share some barriers to housing it, from who's in the room. It looks like um, you all would be very well acquainted with some of these barriers. Um, and this isn't, you know, to depress or bring down the room, but just to have a realistic um, snapshot of what folks are up against when they're looking for permanent housing. Um, I mainly wanted to lift up the racial discrimination that occurs from landlords and service providers, especially when folks are um, attempting to use Section 8 vouchers and uh, that discrimination that they're often faced with. Um, so I'm going to pass it back to Sammy, I believe. Okay, so as we transition to kind of talking a little bit more about shelter, we wanted to ground this section in a scenario. Um, so pretend in your mind it's Saturday and you and your family have been kicked out of your home um, by your abusive partner. You've called every local shelter in your community and all of them are at capacity. Um, the question is, where do you go? And we're not asking for us to, you know, physically express that in the chat or anything. It's really just... Um, Honestly, it's a trick question uh, because the answer in this situation is really nowhere. Um, this scenario was inspired by a family I worked with um, when I was working for Tacoma Public Schools and um, they ended up staying in the doorway of their daughter's school. And it was on a Sunday morning. Um, of course, it was pouring down rain and um, they stayed there for hours. Um, I know that in my work, I've heard countless times in conversations about domestic violence, why don't they just leave? 
And um, something I just want to highlight today is that we know that DV survivors on average take six to seven attempts to leave their abuser. And um, some of the why to that are, are in control. Um, their partner becomes isolated, loses touch with family and friends, um, their lack of resources. Survivors of DV are often cut off from financial resources. Um, survivors of DV are often um, so feel like experience deep isolation from their family and friends. Um, and there are gaps in our resources and service systems. So just because that family was ready to leave their abuser doesn't always mean there's capacity to meet that need. Um, keeping all those factors in mind will help us understand how to show up um, with compassion for families who are fleeing domestic violence. Going back to Kayla. Okay, so here are some of the sheltered types that you'll see on the screen, um, which really vary from community to community. I um, want to be cognizant that there are a lot more resources in, in urban areas like Seattle um, than in some of the rural communities um, that are represented on the call as well. Uh, so using that coordinated entry cheat sheet that um, we referenced earlier will allow you to get a bigger snapshot of the resources available in your community. Um, and then next slide, please. Um, the shelter role is really to just uh, have those basic needs met for it, but it's a very time limited um, uh, resource. So many shelters, they will only allow you to stay either for the night or for like a month or a few, uh, three months maybe. Um, but there are also really strict rules in, in some shelters, such as curfews or uh, proof of homelessness, if you can um, even fathom that. Uh, and stays, like Sammy said, are contingent on capacity. So at the domestic violence shelter I work at in Seattle, um, we're almost always full and we have anywhere from 10 to 20 um, calls a day from survivors uh, attempting to flee. Um, so as you can imagine that, that there's a lot that um, goes into getting into a shelter and even once you're there, then it's a very short uh, time limited stay. Um, and we're gonna move into talking about other housing interventions available. All right, here's that Mentimeter again, told you it would come back. So um, I will drop the link in the chat one more time if that is helpful. Um, and this question is looking for a true false. Um, if you are fully employed while experiencing homelessness, you will qualify for resources immediately to help you find permanent housing. All right. Looks like we got a pretty strong can, uh, group of folks being like, nope, this is false. Let's give it another little bit. Um, we're still leaning very heavily on that false side. So as folks are continuing to answer this, you are correct. That, that is a myth that just because you have uh, employment, you automatically qualify for resources. That isn't to say that having employment doesn't help. That definitely does, but it's not going to be that automatic magic wand to get you into housing. Um, so just making sure that as you're working with families that that you're clear and like, just because you have this doesn't mean that it's gonna be like a magic fix um, into housing immediately. Um, so just kind of trying to keep us into those, uh, the reality of our uh, current housing situation. All right. Um, next slide. Passing it back to Kayla. All right, so we're going to, um... Sammy's going to outline in more in depth some of the housing interventions you see on this slide. Um, I think it just want to lift up how important these are right now as eviction moratoriums are ending um, across the state and um, you know what that will lead to for the realities of, of folks experiencing homelessness or on the brink of homelessness. So take it away, Sammy. So housing intervention that um, I'm sure many of you have also possibly heard of is called diversion. Um, as, as you're seeing on the slide, um, diversion is a light touch approach. Ending homelessness encourages and helps households to come up with their own solutions to housing crisis. Um, so what we want to think about with diversion and, and 
the why behind it. As we know that when you're experiencing housing crisis, we know that it may be extremely overwhelming. Um, you may have a lot of things going on in your mind, around you, in your family. And um, the diversion conversation is really a way to address kind of the trauma of that housing crisis. Um, we know that it can be hard to make decisions when you're experiencing a crisis or you're feeling traumatized by what's happening in your life. Um, so a lot of times diversion is um, referenced as a creative conversation. Um, it's really sitting down with someone to both just try to find like a little bit of calm. Um, there's going to be a lot of open-ended questions to understand kind of what's going on. And the hope is to get to maybe those solutions um, in that process, maybe supports or resources that you haven't been able to think about because you're really in that perpetual crisis mode. Um, utilizing this resource could look like, a, usually it's a one-time intervention. It could look like, say you're um, an unaccompanied youth or a young person and you have family in California and you're experiencing homelessness or housing instability and you're really trying to figure out how to get to California because you know that you have friends and a network there that can stabilize um, both your housing and possibly your education. Um, diversion may be able to come through to help with a bus ticket or transportation to get you there. Um, so we want to definitely drive home. The whole point of diversion is to really stay in that creative place. Um, it's just really acknowledging um, your individual experience, what's going on, and finding ways to really solve that housing crisis. Um, next intervention that we're just going to touch on um, is called rapid rehousing. So, so this is going to be providing a short-term um, rental subsidy or rental assistance, as well as some support services. Um, goal, of course, is to access permanent housing, um, increase self-sufficiency, and stay housed. Um, utilizing this resource could really look like um, they want it to be client-driven. They want it to focus on kind of what the family's strengths are. Um, say a family with a mother working part-time is about to be promoted at their job. Um, she has a past eviction from a few years ago, and it's been a struggle to find a place willing to rent to her because of that. Um, the caseworker or rapid rehousing specialist would help her advocate for her situation could look like anywhere from like helping with housing search, helping to reach out to the potential landlord and just share kind of some details of what's happening. Um, we've heard across the state that some people are um, drafting letters, kind of like a cover letter to just say, this is where I'm at and this is why I'm interested in renting the unit you have. Um, and then really be able to come through and support with that moving cost. Sometimes when you have not the most ideal deal rental history, um, a landlord will ask for an elevated security deposit. Um, so the rapid rehousing program would definitely want to show up for that family and help in that way. Um, for the moving costs, additionally, also um, provide a few months of rental subsidy potentially. Um, it would be an agreed upon amount um, and it would be worked out with the household as well as the rapid rehousing specialist. Um, just also wanted to say one more time, um, these rapid rehousing would be accessed through your coordinated entry system, just as a reminder. Um, another housing intervention that we're touching on today is going to be called permanent supportive housing. Um, so permanent supportive housing is really reserved for households that have at least one member, adult or child, that is living with a disability. Um, when you have a disability and it's documented, you would qualify for social security benefits um, known as SSI and receive monthly payments. Um, but just keep in mind, oftentimes when you are living with um, certain disabilities, it does make um, employment challenging. Sometimes it isn't even something that you're able to engage in due to the disability you're living with. Um, so as of January 2021, um, federal benefit rate was 794 for an individual um, receiving um, Social Security. And um, some examples of that could be um, living with illness or again, just living with a documented disability, working with a doctor and um, getting that um, proof of your situation is one piece of how you qualify for these services. Um, I also want to add that 
receiving social security benefits can be really, really challenging um, in itself. Um, I worked with a lot of um, individuals and families who would have to apply multiple times. So you would often apply, be denied um, due to paperwork, not reflecting a situation the right way or um, kind of get in that, um, get in that loop. Um, so it can be a really traumatic and frustrating process as well. Um, what we know is that if you're receiving $794 a month, um, and maybe you have some limitations to employment, um, affordability is a huge concern when it comes to housing. So permanent supportive housing really looks like um, a unit that acknowledges that income level um, and will um, subsidize, your, subsidize your rent so you're able to stay um, these properties. So this could look like scattered site, it could look like apartment complexes. Um, and if you were accessing this resource, um, oftentimes there would be a waiting list or potentially a placement if there were openings um, that were seen by your local coordinated entry system. Obviously they would also kind of want to um, check um, eligibility um, to show that you were a part um, of this SSI program as well. So those are just a couple um, of the main interventions that could be accessed through your coordinated entry for families or young people experiencing homelessness. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it back to Kayla. Thanks, Sammy. Um, so I know trauma-informed care has been a big uh, buzzword over the past few years and that we have a lot of experts in the room. So feel free to uh, share in the chat ways that you practice trauma-informed care um, in your work. Um, but I just wanted to highlight uh, that, you know, it's normal as humans to be curious, um, but it's really important to only ask what is necessary um, and asking questions in a non-invasive way to see what the family's experience was and what their background is to see if they qualify um, for various services, such as like if they were a veteran, then they might be able to qualify for a VASH voucher. Um, but to really just again, ask what is necessary in a strengths-based way, because as they go from thinking about that housing services map from earlier, as they go from organization to organization, trying to receive help, constantly having to replay their trauma and tell their stories over and over again is super um, re-traumatizing. And we want to limit that by um, only asking, you know, what we need to know and to not make assumptions or uh, even comments that we might think are small, um, could have a huge impact on families. Like if, you know, just in passing, I've heard folks uh, been told, that have been told um, like, well, how did you get so far behind on rent on the first place? Or things like this that are very, um, might seem small, but have an incredible impact on not just the individual and how they feel about themselves, but their relationship to the school system in general. And then whenever possible, nothing about us without us, meaning that while we're there to support families and students experiencing homelessness, they're the experts in their own lives. And um, they're the really, they're the ones that should be taking ownership of um, the decisions they make and the ways that they want to uh, move through the housing system. Um, I just, yeah, I think that now we're gonna get into some questions real quick before a break. All right, so before we move into a mid-break, Sammy, did you have something you wanted to add there? There was just kind of, as we think about trauma-informed care and we think about the ground we've covered so far, um, again, to reference, like we know that um, you know, this is a really hard place for students and households to be in. Um, and we just want to encourage, even within our roles and even feeling those limitations of capacity or stress and all of those things that are also happening in, in our work that we do. Um, and it's a really simple little quote. Um, it was Robin Williams, but it's everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Um, so be kind always. And um, that was just something we wanted to make sure to take a little moment to remember. Um, this is a lot. I know that um, we've covered quite a bit of ground so far. But, um, we really want to center the needs of people in these situations and students and think about how we can best support them. All right, so now we're, looks like we already have a question in the chat. Um, so if you have another question, um, feel free to add it into the chat or raise your hand. 
Um, this first question is um, asking about uh, housing first and how it relates to permanent supportive housing. Um, Kayla or Sammy or anyone else in the room have a, a response for that? So housing first is a model um, and like one of its main tenants is that we think about, um, we, we believe in the importance of housing above all else. So that means like years ago, um, housing providers could literally ask or UA and do all of these ridiculous things, honestly. They could get into your business about like, well, are you sober? And if you're not sober, you can't have this apartment. Um, so Housing First was really a, pu a pushback um, for practices like that to say like, no one can survive, focus, function, you know, excel in their lives in any way without first being able to have shelter and their basic needs met. So it really focuses on specifically housing um, above all else. How that relates to permanent supportive housing, um, like there's still su permanent supportive housing um, providers that would model housing first. So I would say, I would hope that they're working together. It really depends on the community, kind of how those um, services are prioritized and offered. But um, I would say from experience with the permanent supportive housing provider that I work with in Pierce County, um, they definitely adopted a housing first model. Um, so I'm not sure if that totally clarifies, but um, if it's being done right, they're being done in alignment. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. Um, looks like that did answer Vivian's question. So um, it looks like we haven't had any other questions come up in the chat. So um, if you do have any while we're on break, feel free to submit them. Um, but we're gonna go into a short break. Um, it is right now 10.49. Oh, we got a question in here from Tasha. So. I think what we're gonna do is I'm gonna say, let's do like a break slash. We can continue having a little bit of conversation if folks would like. Um, so if you need to take a break, feel free to step away. We will reconvene at 11 o'clock. If you would like to hang around um, while we uh, answer some more of these questions or have a little bit more discussion, um, please do. But otherwise we will see you at 11 o'clock. And then I'm gonna stop screen sharing for the time being. Um, all right, um, so I would say we're going for it. Um, my immediate reaction to that, Tasha, is really that yes. Um, so what's really developed like as a, as a response to conflicts like that or to having maybe criminal history and or, um, you know, some rental history things that landlords aren't wanting um, they were called kind of in Pierce County where landlord liaison projects. So what it would do is work with landlords, recruiting landlords. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the one we recently, um, we recently met housing connector, I think they were called. Um, and their main focus was to really work with landlords as opposed to work with households, but they would subcontract with housing providers to say like, you're gonna help provide support for the families, but we're gonna be providing support specifically for the landlords. And that would look like um, really just a lot, almost like a case management type system for landlords, but it would also kind of help them work through challenges. It would help them you know, to understand, um, get more in touch with family situations. But um, I believe there's also was like a legal piece to it it's like, we'll help you understand landlord tenant law, we'll help you understand kind of what your rights are as a landlord. Um, so as much as like, we know there's some landlords out there that are just not treating people right. Um, there's also landlords out there that are, you know, under-resourced. If we think about COVID, we know that that has put a lot of stress on landlords in so many like unprecedented ways. So um, long, that was a long answer, but the short answer would be, um, yes, I do believe that that is something that is being thought about um, to kind of incentivize landlords to think about um, serving vulnerable households, such as making even households. Thank you. 
I had just shared in the chat um, a program in King County uh, called the Landlord Liaison Program um, that's similar to what Sammy was talking about, recruits landlords that are um, able to work with folks that have uh, some of those barriers that we discussed before. Um, this is a really important question. Tasha, thank you for lifting this up um, because we know so many folks get turned away for um, you know, criminal records or evictions, um, especially when we're talking about domestic violence survivors. Um, oh. that oftentimes they'll have evictions on the records due to domestic violence um, or, you know, been wrongfully convicted of something when they were uh, protecting themselves um, from DV. Uh, so that's just one resource here in King County. Um, and thank you, Sheila. It looks like Pierce County also has a landlord liaison program. Um, Amy, I'm honestly not sure about your question, so I'm going to do some research while we have our break here. It's a really good one. Thank you. I, I would say we could send over, we can find the link. Um, it really depends with um, Section 8. So Section 8 is kind of governed in a different way um, in terms of what who they can and cannot serve. Um, I mean, they're, I think they're all overseen by HUD housing urban development. Um, there's certain criminal records that are not allowed in Section 8 or public housing. Um, I worked for a housing authority briefly and um, I remember like there was one around um, manufacturing meth. That was, there's a hard no. And, um, people could have, um, they could go through a process where they could explain their story and maybe um, override that. Um, I know that would love for you to just hold that and we can bring that um, back when we get to our panelists because we do have someone representing the housing authority from Tacoma today. Um, but there, I would say like it's a yes and no answer. So it's not entirely daunting. And like if you're experiencing those things, you absolutely won't qualify. There are definitely some exceptions where you will qualify. And then there's kind of more in that um, giving clients the power to really share their story and to be considered if they receive that initial, like, I'm sorry, we can't serve you. There is that process in place. Thank you. <laughs> is it okay to ask a question out loud? Absolutely. Sorry, I didn't know how to put it in the chat. Hi, Sammy. <laughs> Um, I'm just curious, like, because a lot of the policies that are impacted people regarding housing, like, what can we do as, like, people who are on the ground, like, doing the work to really inform policy changes, like, even someone like me who works full time and has a steady income, like, I struggle with finding, like, affordable housing without paying, like, you know, $2,000 a month to stay somewhere. So I really start looking at the policies and how are we impacting like you know legislation to make changes for people who we know we're in the role of you know being in more privilege but really looking at our families like yeah I understand what you're going through um, and so I don't know if that has been touched on but that is where my heart is in this work like how do we really get the systems to change and do something different um, I can't express how much I love you raising that. Um, I think that what we learn is as we work with families, you start to realize like no story is the same, but you start to realize something's shaping why these things are happening. And it's always in policies, right? And you're like, if this broke policy could be fixed, maybe families wouldn't be so traumatized by our systems. Um, we have a couple things happening. So we have Megan from our office or from Building Changes who will be presenting a little bit about um, this legislative session and how it relates to housing policies. Um, I don't know if you've, the th first thing that came to mind um, is um, Homeless Housing Advocacy Day happens every year. Um, it's overseen usually by the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. It's a way for you to meet with your legislators and really raise the concerns that you're seeing. Um, there's different days reserved for, you know, across the year for legislative action like that. Like as a person, you're like, I work for this school. I'm pissed about this and I need someone to hear it. You can keep showing up in these spaces to talk directly to your representatives. You can send emails, you can send letters. Um, what I will say, um, engaging in those activities, um, you can also, you know, um, 
provide testimony um, from the things you're seeing with students and the advocacy that you're doing. Um, what I will say is that, as you mentioned, within a you have a full time job, um, so it's it's hard to find those opportunities. Um, I also will say when I worked, this is you know, do you recall um, taking the day off to participate in um, homeless housing advocacy day when I worked at the school district. So there's sometimes there's some political lines um, involved as well, <laughs> just in, just to own that and say that out loud. Um, I would also just say that it's, um, you're in it for the long haul. Um, if you want that instant <laughs> gratification, um, I feel like I sometimes would show up and seek that and I would get positive energy from the experience but like we gotta we gotta work at this and chip away at it so I would just want to be extra honest but um yeah, hopefully in Megan's piece um there will be some takeaways for you um I'm happy to share too if you aren't already engaged with that homeless housing advocacy work um it just helps you also to connect with others sharing um some of the um some of the frustrations that I'm sure you're seeing in your district in your school Um, so I just want to highlight, we've got about two minutes left in break. Um, there's been a, another conversation kind of happening in the chat over here, really touching on um, the rightful frustration and the misalignment between the HUD definition of homelessness and McKinney-Vento. Um, so uh, with it doubled up, so I can, um, we've got about two minutes left. So Kayla and Leslie, if you guys want to keep talking about it, or I don't know if, um, I know I need to actually step away for a minute, um, but we'll be back in two minutes. And Kayla and Sam, if you need to step away, please do. But we can continue the conversation um, at another point later in the training or um, elsewhere as we see need to. So this is Leslie. One Leslie, thing I, I love that say, you did it. One, one thing mm -hmm. I do want to say is that, um, Option three has been in the HUD definition forever. Option yep. three says, um, if you are um, if you are homeless under any other federal definition, and I realize that HUD says no, doubled up isn't um, mm -hmm. homeless under our definition, but they put it there under option three, so it is there. And right. so, why aren't they recognizing it? That is my frustration. It has been going on for years. And you're you're smiling at me, Sammy, because you I know. feel the same way. This is it's ridiculous. Right. Well, and it's really that that wave of priority prioritization, right? That came through via HUD is what kind of has like pushed that off the table in, in so many ways. That's just how I've interpreted it, you know, over the last decade or so. And I Leslie, I know I know you're in it. So um I feel that in so many ways. And I think where the argument lies now and what I hope to see the, like where I hope to see the work go is that if we think about cross systems impacts and we think about what can be done if we accept that we want students to excel, but housing stability is a piece of that. If we learn that, if we learn to like regard that across our systems as something that's the most important. I think that we can move in a better direction as opposed to being like, oh, well, they're living, you know, on a couch, which is better than living outside. Um, so I think our system needs a lot of work to catch up. Um, I remember just wanting to rip my hair out. It says, you know, by other federal statutes, but we'll say from the housing side, when we were applying for grants and things like that with our county, um, have always prioritized category one and category four. So category one, literally homeless, category four, fleeing domestic violence. Um, and I had never seen, never seen that category three show up almost anywhere. I will say that's promising in the youth, young adult services sector. Um, they are really trying to leverage category two um, kind of imminent risk. Um, and there are programs that are able to serve students in that, in that way. So yeah, that's a that's one of those like would love to talk for hours about that and and but also I feel like there is a little bit of hope in terms of like we're seeing some small movement some slow movement in a better direction. Yeah, and what I see is it's there. 
it's written, it's on their definition. So you can't tell me that it's not in their definition. It's written on their website. So anyway, I'm going to shut up now because I know everybody <laughs> feels the same way I do, but it's so confusing. All right, for folks who are coming back from the break, um, we just kept chatting that whole time. So um, we will most likely be posting a recording of this if you're wondering what you missed. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, so please join us um, if you can, like if you're comfortable like turning your video on, that helps me know like folks are actually back. Um, there's always, you know, a little fear as a Zoom presenter that um, people just are gonna, you know, check out after the break. Um, if you have meetings, of course, that makes sense, but uh, just wanna make sure everyone's returned. So glad to see some faces. Um, all right, we're gonna get rolling. Um, so this next section we're gonna go into is talking more about kind of housing authorities. We've been touching on it a bit kind of throughout our conversation today, um, but wanna go in a little bit more there. So guess what? We got another Mentimeter. Um, yay, thanks. Glad you're back, Jolie. Um, all right, finding that Mentimeter link again, um, if you already have it up, great. So today's Mentimeter, or this Welcome Back from Break Mentimeter is asking, um, how long can households anticipate to be on a public housing wait list in order to receive assistance? So we're looking anywhere from a few months to 10 years. And where on that scale do you think um, households can anticipate being on that public housing wait list? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we're trending, trending long here. You, you folks have uh, been working in the, the housing system, I can tell. <laughs> Give it a, another. <laughs> Another minute or so, and then Sammy, if you want to jump in and uh, kind of give your your answer here. I just want to say this is the second time we've offered this training, and um, this group this group knows what's going on. So last group, um, we didn't see really anywhere close to um, multiple years. We saw maybe a couple years, but. Um, this is also a little outdated, but as I mentioned, when I, I worked for the Tacoma Housing Authority in 2016, um, the families were informed they could be on the wait list from six to eight years. So you all nailed it. Um, and that reality is, is real. Um, in some communities, you can't even get on the waiting list. So it's either you wait six to eight years or you wait for the waiting list to open. Um, we see housing authorities do lotteries for, you know, housing opportunities or housing subsidies. Um, Section 8 is um, also a way that we understand this work or this resource. But um, yeah, we just wanted to check in on the reality of, you know, housing authorities do incredible things in providing all kinds of um, resources for families and individuals needing housing, but also don't have endless, you know, they don't have endless money, they don't have endless units. Um, so just... I'm so impressed. Well done, team. <laughs> um, this is going to take us into our next section. Section um, just covering a little bit about public housing. As mentioned, we also hear this um, being talked about as Section Eight, or um, maybe um, housing opportunity vouchers. But this is direct HUD language um, around what public housing is. I don't want to read everything to you, but um, Really, it is a resource um, established to provide decent and safe rental housing for eligible low-income families, elderly, and persons living with disabilities. Um, so when it says that HA, that's the housing authority, um, they determine um, your eligibility, eligibility, excuse me, based on income, um, based on if you qualify, and based on um, citizenship status or eligible immigration status. Um, next slide, please. Um, also, this is a little text heavy, but um, the housing authority is, is where you would go to receive a housing choice voucher. Um, some of the things that the housing authority is going to do um, is really oversee ongoing functions of those um, voucher type programs, um, assure compliance with leases, 
um, perform periodic re-examinations of the family's income at least yearly um, and transfer families from one unit to another um, if that's something that needs to happen due to overcrowding. Um, this is not, you know, there's more to this list um, and we have links embedded for you all when you get the slides um, after this presentation. But what we really want you to know or take away about housing authorities is, again, they're doing really important work and they're an instrumental part of the housing system. But oftentimes come with a long wait time. Um, and when you are receiving this resource or um, when you're receiving this resource, there's still things that you will need to um, show eligibility for to maintain the resource itself. Um, also, when you're on that waiting list for six to eight years, um, you will need to check in regularly, update your information in their system. Um, there's pieces of it like that, that when you think about housing crisis, sometimes those things are hard to remember. Um, I know when I'm having stressful weeks, I forget what day it is. And that is, you know, silly, but like this is real life and having to check in and, you know, keep tabs on all of these things, have all your documentation, um, often can present um, another layer of stress. Um, next section that we're gonna kind of breeze through here is um, affordable housing. And guess what? We got another Mentimeter. So um, this one is looking at if my gross income is $3,000 per month, how much should an affordable unit cost? So that's including rent and utilities. Um, we've got a multiple choice question here. So let's see what y'all are thinking. On a $3,000 a month income. Oh. <laughs> should or does, you know? <laughs> fair, fair. I. <laughs> Uh, should, as, you are, as you all are kind of voting here, um, just want to make a quick distinction. So, you know, there's housing authorities, there's market rate housing, there's affordable housing. So in this context, when we're talking about affordable housing, um, what we mean is a rental offered below market rate. Um, I'm just going to pause there as we looking at this a little more and also know that that also includes utilities. All right. So we've got a couple more answers coming in here. All right, we got some, some math equations going into the chat here. This is so um, the, uh, the answer for like, what it should be, right, is um, $900. So you uh, spot on there with the thinking about it in terms of an equation. Um, obviously, if we could have a $300 or $600 uh, option, that would be, I do, that would be great. I would love that. Um, but 900 is um, what is considered an affordable unit um, with $3,000 a month. Um, and if you can find that, great, but um, we all are aware of the housing market, so maybe you're not gonna. <laughs> um, all right, back to you. So when we think about affordable housing opportunities, um, what we want, what I want to kind of highlight today is that, you know, you would be paying 30% of your income to your rent utilities, and that would make that unit affordable generally. Um, but also what we should know or what's good to know about is that it, the low income housing tax credit subsidizes the acquisition, construction and rehabilitation of affordable rental housing for low and moderate income tenants. What that means is that that tax credit actually builds the infrastructure and builds the buildings for um, families and households to access um, affordable rent. Um, they obviously build with the intention of serving um, households that are below need below market rate rent units. Um, and what exists out there in some communities are organizations like Mercy Housing, which oversee um, entire affordable housing um, properties. 
So that's different from a private landlord, and it's also different from working with a housing authority in that respect. Um, this resource, like utilizing this resource, an affordable housing resource would look like potentially being on a wait list for up to 12 months um, for families that are living doubled up. Um, can be a housing solution that isn't immediate, but provides some level of hope. Um, back when I was working with the school district, um, I would refer families to affordable housing options and um, it would, again, not yield an immediate resource, but it would get you on a list that could produce permanent housing at some point. Um, and it wasn't that six to eight year mark. So um, I'm going to go to the next slide here. And what we're showing here is if you're ever curious about kind of what is the fair market rate rent in our area, um, what we have showing here is um, King County um, and you know, a two bedroom uh, FMR on a two bedroom is $18.99. Um, that's to say um, it's expensive. And this is usually what governs um, our housing programs. So um, that FMR rate determines like if a unit, say you have a housing voucher and you want to rent a unit, um, it will need to be at that rate at the or below that fair market rate rent. Um, so it just makes it very clear that affordability is um, serious concern in this process. Um, there's a couple links that we're going to share now in chat um, that are also going to include the Tenants Union of Washington State. Um, if you're trying to kind of see what low income housing um, is available in your area, um, that is something um, that you can look into by your community. Um, this also, unfortunately, um, you know, if clients are not able to find a unit um, at or below FMR, um, we wanted to highlight that it really kind of lowers the availability of what's out there. Um, so even if you're working with a housing authority and you have that voucher, um, still unfortunately doesn't mean that there is, you know, a vast inventory of units that you'll be able to utilize with that voucher. Um, so now we are going, I'm going to get back to Joey. So we are actually going to switch our order a little bit to make sure that we have folks on our panel um, still with us. Um, so we're gonna do our providers panel first and then we'll jump back to advocacy updates with Megan. So um, here's the providers panel. Today we are um, excited to have three folks with us. Um, we have Marty Higgins from the Tacoma Housing Authority, Heather Eddy from St. Margaret's Shelter, Catholic Community Char or Catholic Charities in Spokane. And we have Kari who um, has lived experience. And I'm gonna pass it, I think over maybe to uh, Kayla, do you want to get us rolling with this? I think it's Sammy, but you're in more contact. So. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, Kari is at work right now, so she's just trying to figure out how to um, rejoin. So she'll be with us uh, here shortly. Uh, then I'll, Sammy, if you want to take it away for a second with uh, maybe Marty and Heather, that's a good place to start. Okay. Um, great. Thanks for kind of pivoting with us. Um, so we hope after today um, that you're all thinking about who your local community partners could be. Um, opportunities to collaborate, maybe even some of your local legislative authorities um, that could help aid in figuring out affordable housing options. Um, what we want to hear, our provider panel today is we're hearing directly from communities about um, what this looks like and what their interaction with the homeless or housing system looks like. So if um, Marty or Heather, um, I would love for you to answer, what's your connection and or experience with the housing system? Um, and we'll just start there. Well, um, hi everybody. My name is Marty Higgins. I work for the Tacoma Housing Authority and um, Really my connection, uh, it, it's uh, much more on the educational side of, of helping uh, families that have uh, uh, in our system, but are maybe coming out of McGinney Vento into our system. Um, but even the folks that are in our system still deal with a lot of uh, in, in, in stable housing. Uh, their things happen where they uh, wind up for whatever reasons, uh, they're still at risk at uh, even, even through our system. And so what a lot of what 
I am able to do is kind of work with uh, our partners and, and other uh, community folks to help really uh, figure out how to identify, work with those families and um, figure out how to, how to uh, find solutions to, to the problems that they're going through. Um, again, a lot of what I do really personally is on, on the educational nexus of how that works with uh, students and families and, and our school district here. So um, Heather might have a little more background on, on actually working with the, the housing end of it than I do. Hi, um, I'm Heather, and uh, my connection is I run St. Margaret's Shelter, where we have 17 families who, I would say every one of our families at Shelter are involved with McKinney Vinto. We also have an additional program that's run through Catholic Charities that I oversee, where we have community health workers in the school. Um, we have a Commerce Grant and a OSPI grant that allows us to have those community workers in the school. We have a little bit of flex funds to help with some things, um, a lot of case management. So we, we kind of hit housing from every level. Um, here at the shelter, our families are literally homeless. Our families that our community health workers with, I would say a good majority of them are doubled up families. Um, so we kind of have to work around, you know, what avenues there are for literally homeless, what avenues there are for doubled up and um, work with it that way. Thank you, Heather. Hi, Kari, it's so good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's Kari's second day at her new job in a manager role. So, so proud of you, really excited that you could take the time uh, to join us for a few minutes today. Um, so if you want to just share as much as you're comfortable with of just what was your experience navigating uh, the housing system here? So my, my experience um, was very challenging. Um, I was given a lot of leads while being in the shelter but none of them panned out. Um, I had to step beyond that. I was thankful for the counselors like Kayla um, who were there who gave me extra leads to follow. Um, I wrote many letters to um, different congressmen in um, the Seattle area. I, I wrote the television station. I couldn't sleep because um, my days were, being, were coming to an end at the shelter. And I didn't want to be out on the streets um, with my children. So then they they swapped me from one shelter to another. So they took someone from another shelter and uh, put them there, sitting there. But even with that, I only had a 30-day grace period. Then the 30 days came and went, and I was back to the um, hotel rooms again. And then I finally got a call. Um, from an apartment building that had accepted me. But my credit was so bad that I, the only way that they would continue with the application was for me to write an affidavit. So I wrote the affidavit, and then a couple of days later, um, I was accepted. While being there, I've had the opportunity to fix my credit. I'm now almost at an 800 FICO score. <laughs> So, although it was a journey, it was a journey that was well worth it. Thank you so much, Kari. I just want to touch you before you go back to work. Oh, one more um, question of what role, if any, did the school um, or the school district play in your experience? Like, did you offer, did you get any help from the school district to find housing? No, I did not. Um, and I, I also elected to keep, I didn't want to, because we moved around so much, I didn't want to move her school around. So I have kept my child in the same school. She'll be graduating this year and she's completed kindergarten through the fifth grade at the same school. So it might not be a big accomplishment to most, but it was a lot, it meant a lot to me to be able to at least keep her in the same school. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you, you want to share? Just so you know, on the call, there's uh, a lot of folks that work at school. Don't. Go ahead. Um, don't give up. I, I want to tell that any parent that's out there, don't give up. Because I know it becomes very discouraging. If there was any challenge that could have been faced, I think I faced it on this journey. 
but I'm on the other end now. And the sun will shine. <laughs> I know it doesn't look like it, but it will. Thank you so much, Kari. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. You're more than welcome anytime. Thank you. You guys have a great day. You too. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, hanging while we made sure to get Kari on the line there. Um, you know, folks are working as you all are. So making sure that we're trying to pivot with the when when we can get everyone on is great. So I'm going to pass back to Sammy and to keep kind of talking with uh, Heather and Eddie or Heather and Martin. Sorry, I just said Heather's full name. <laughs> uh, I I feel like um, so glad we could have Kari join us, even if it was for a little bit, because I feel like some of those barriers um, that we see. Um, for people accessing housing services definitely came through. Um, I would love to hear Heather, Marty, um, what other barriers maybe that Kari didn't bring up? What other barriers do you see in accessing housing services in your communities? I think one of the big ones we run into is people with addictions and criminal history. Um, criminal history is really a hard one. And when we're applying for housing, with our clients at the shelter or clients that we're working with the community health workers in the schools, if we know that that's going to be a barrier, we will automatically start the process of an appeal letter that explains all of it. Um, we also, our case managers encourage and work with our clients to write a rental resume. Um, Um, issues that they need to address so that they're up front and at the very beginning um, places know that so that we're not you know wasting their time on application fee after application fee after application fee if they're going to go on a waiting list let's submit everything right then so we know if we even have a chance if they're not going to give us a chance or give us that appeal for it we shouldn't be spending their money or what little flex funds we have for those application fees, right? We need to figure out where to channel our money the best way for our clients. Um, so those, you know, those are two big barriers that we really face. I think the best way to work on those barriers is really getting to know the landlords in your community. Um, and I can tell you right now, we know we have some landlords who they don't care what your record is. If you have a housing voucher, they'll work with you because they know that's guaranteed. On the flip side, we have some who will take somebody with a criminal record, but not evictions. Somebody who will take someone with evictions, but not a criminal record. So I think it's really a lot of knowing your community, your resources and who you're working with um, to be able to get people housed when you're facing those kind of barriers. And, you know, from my perspective, uh, a lot of what Heather said is the same thing we, we, we see all the time here. Um, one, of, one of the other big challenges, and um, I know Kari had mentioned it too, is it was being able to keep the kids in, in a stable schooling environment. That's huge for us in the fact that uh, as, as even with vouchers, it's harder and harder for families to find those, those market rate or under, uh, you know, units. And as here in Tacoma, we're seeing them more and more going out and uh, further, further away, keeping those kids at uh, their, uh, their base schools. This was one of the big things that we've been working on for years, trying to get that uh, uh, as, a, as a part of their stable education, because that's what's one of the biggest things that we see in success for families is to have that as, as uh, um, something that the kids can rely on and families can rely on uh, from that perspective. So we, we do a lot of work trying to uh, work around and do everything we can to, to keep those kids where they need to be and to get those services. Because a lot of times when those kids do move from schools, they, they sometimes lose access to some of those other services too. Um, and that's just uh, one of those things that we really want to pinpoint and we work hard to, to keep that going. I think we're really fortunate in the fact that we have um, community health workers in the elementary schools and then at the high school level. So we have someone who can reach both ends of that. And we're looking at 
hopefully some point a middle school. So while those families are moving, because sometimes we see that happen too, right? Like a kid is maybe um, in a doubled up situation in fifth or sixth grade, and then they move on to middle school. And we've kind of lost track of them again until they're in high school, right? Um, so if we can stay with those families, stay the course the way through, even if we're not financially supporting them, or even if they get into housing to help keep them stable, um, they can always come to us for resources, uh, food baskets, things like that, that help, you know, if, if you're not happy to pay that $75 for food, maybe you can use that $75 towards rent. So our mm -hmm. ability to follow those families the whole way through and help keep them stable is huge. Thank you both um, for sharing that. I kind of the big question here being that we're talking about housing and we have a lot of, um, education advocates here today. Um, in what capacity in your roles are you working directly with schools or school districts? I know that Heather mentioned, you know, the community health workers, but um, maybe Marty can start us off with what that looks like for Tacoma Housing Authority. Absolutely, Sammy. Um, one, my particular role is to kind of be a uh, liaison between the families uh, in, in Tacoma Housing Authority and um, our local districts here, uh, both Tacoma, uh, Clover Park, and some of the other surrounding ones. And in that, it's to help, uh, it works two ways. We, we work at a district level to try to figure out what, what programs we need to have to kind of support all our kids. Right now, we have something called the Whole Family Services uh, Program that really supports uh, families that are struggling either with educational issues or issues maintaining the housing with us. Um, but what we can do is, the district, uh, we, we work with individual schools and they're able to, um, they know our kids and they can see a lot of problems that are happening in schools that we may not necessarily know, but can lead back to issues at home or issues with housing. Uh, conversely, we can see things on our end and then work with the district that way. And we can sit down, come come together, figure out uh, strategies and, and resources for these families We um, in these programs. We also have uh, we've some flexible funding and we can support them, be it transportation, uh, be it as uh, simple as as finding shoes for kids to get to school. Uh, we, we're, we're fortunate enough to work with a district here that does have a lot of uh, funding for uh, student support funding for those things, too. But we we're able to tackle it on our end, too. And we have a little more flexibility in what we can do and, and how we can support those families. So uh, uh, really, it is uh, working individually with uh, be it. Uh, uh, community liaisons or social workers or uh, teachers themselves, principals, uh, administration, all levels of that. And basically just being able to recognize what, what is happening, work with the families and just create a full support system around them to really make sure and ensure that, uh, that those students are, are, and those families are, are getting the successes they need um, both in and out of school. Um. Like I said, we have community health workers in the schools, so we work literally directly in the schools. They have offices in the schools, and then they have an office here at the shelter. Um, and then through our coordinated entry, which is run through Catholic Charities, all of the people doing the coordinated entry system are aware of who those community health workers are and how to get a hold of them. So when we're doing our assessment we're asking what school those children are at and if they're at any of the schools that we have a community health worker that family's immediately linked to that community health worker um and we work very closely with mckinney vento actually while i've been on this call i just received a text message from sarah miller who works with mckinney vento in spokane asking if she could come spend a couple hours here this afternoon just to check in with families um so i think you know we're, we're really blessed here at St. Margaret's that we are so involved in numerous layers and levels. So we can look at it through all sorts of different lenses, right? We can look at it through the shelter clients who are literally homeless. We can look at through the families that are doubled up and the families that maybe just this month are a little bit short. So we can do some diversion with them to say like, hey, how about you go down to our HFCA? Maybe we could look at a car payment for you and you apply money to your rent because obviously if you're housed we can't do diversion to pay for your rent but we can help with other things so um and and all of the schools know that and even the schools that aren't 
housing a CHW, we have come to the point that they reach out to us regularly. I mean, I'll get calls from Central Valley, even though we don't have um, a community health worker there. So this program has really, um, I think, expanded people's thought process. They're, they're seeing more and more how much having someone in that school to help with these services means. And, and hopefully that will evolve into a situation where maybe someday all schools will have that. I mean, I think that if we could do that, we could reduce that doubled up and homeless student population so much if we could just get those workers into the schools. And if I ever win the lottery, we'll do a lot of it, but. <laughs> uh, so, so great. Um, I just want to elevate like, what I'm hearing from Heather and Marty is that a lot of this is relationships. Um, those relationships take time and they take effort and they take capacity to maintain. Um, if we are able to pull that off in our communities, there's all of these great things that have kind of come through alongside those relationships, which is so cool to hear. We have a couple more minutes. If anyone in our training right now has some questions they have for uh, Marty or Heather, um, we would love to open up for just a few minutes. Um, and if not, um, we can also just continue to our next section. Um, I do want to highlight there's a really cool conversation happening in the chat now about uh, application fees and uh, maybe some advocacy we can do to get rid of those. Feel like we've got a strong advocacy group here so this is uh yes. very fun um there is a, a question for marty um asking um marty do you work with puyallup school district at all not we don't have a lot of contact with Puyallup. Uh, mostly we work with districts where our kids are are at and so we don't uh i think we've had one or two there um so we've had light touches but but nothing that has really majorly come up uh, over the past couple of years add a little more to that too i know that the Pierce County Housing Authority, right? That would um, be the housing authority if you are living in Puyallup. Um, so they might be worth um, reaching out to. Um, with, we'll say as a disclaimer, um, housing authorities are very different in the way they do work, even though they are, you know, under HUD guidelines. Um, I do know Tacoma Housing Authority has been seen as like a very progressive um, agency. Um, they also are known as a moving to work housing authority. So. Um, I just want to, you know, disclaim that, um, Alexander, it definitely would be worth a call to Pierce County Housing Authority to see how they show up for Puyallup, um, but they may not have the same or similar programming in terms of their engagement with the education system. Um, seeing a hand from Vivian. Yeah, um, uh, Marty and Heather, what could uh, districts in Lee, well, what are districts in liaisons doing well that you really love and what could be better? Um, what could what could districts do better to build those relationships um, or improve relationships or continue the relationships with um, your organizations? One of the things I'm, I think I'm seeing the most uh, as far as as what we're seeing really, really well is is constant communication is being able to have these lines open, having um, folks in schools be able to reach out anytime at all times um, and just be able to have those conversations, because a lot of the things we're seeing are things that are happening quickly and to have the kind of immediate responses, immediate reactions um, are that's what we're seeing is is great ways of solving a lot of the problems that we're seeing our families have. Um, and as far as, as to get better with those things, I think it's really, um, you know, we start kind of at the district level, but it, I'm surprised uh, almost daily uh, how some of the information about what we're doing in some of the schools doesn't reach to all the schools. It's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, I've got some schools that, that we work really, really well together, and I've got some schools that we do have a lot of population of kids at that aren't, for whatever reason, it's just not working quite as well. And, uh, you know, sort of that that ability to get and get the word out what we can do, you know, is, is that's what I'm saying kind of at the top down level, that system level from the district, kind of a better way of, of getting that information out, um, really being able to work with us that way. Um, the, the most success I have is when we've got uh, leadership at a school or, or a counselor or a liaison or social worker or what have you, um, when I work with them 
previously and then they've gone to another school my gosh it just opens up that school and it's it's sort of one of those things where once we have experience in doing it 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 changes the whole the whole game but but and it's not resistance from top down it's just really a hard way of uh i'm saying at least here in tacoma um getting that the that information out the, those resources available to all those, those other schools that you know may be dealing with with uh, maybe THA students that they haven't had in the past, but because of changing rent situations and uh, or we, we have properties that are expanding, those students are now in these schools. And uh, that's one of the biggest things I'm seeing is, is, is our, our gap is just that, that communication. I would agree that communication is huge. Um, I think probably the first year we started with this, there wasn't, like you say, not necessarily resistance, but they're fairly protective of their students too, right? They they want to protect their families and they care about their families. And you are a stranger coming in with a program they've never used before. How reliable are you going to be for your family? So I think just fostering that relationship and showing that we are always there for those families, that we are available, um, that we're not going to just throw out some empty promises and walk away but were their boots on the ground to do that work with them is huge. Um, my wish of what we could do better would just be once again, that we could have a worker in every school, right? Um, I, I don't know that there's a school in this area that couldn't benefit from one of the workers. And so I guess that would be, my wish would be that somebody on a high, high level funding source wise would see what a benefit this is to have those individuals in the school to help with the families and find some sort of bond or levy or resource to be able to fund that for all schools, I think would, would ultimately be the goal. Thank you. That would be exciting. <laughs> I do know that we do have building points of contact in every building. And, um, you know, I think this is a really great idea to be thinking about how can we train our building you know make sure building points of contact are trained or and or connected with their housing programs and their housing providers in their respective communities because that's across the state that we you know that we um have that we have that that we're supposed to have that um, so this has been such an incredible conversation. Um, thank you so much, Marty and Heather, for joining us. Um, we are going to pivot into our advocacy update. And then um, our breakout rooms are cut short a little bit today because we've had such great conversation in the rest of the training. Um, so just know we will be getting into breakout rooms um, for a little bit at the end. But for now, I'm going to um, share my screen again and pass it off to introduce Megan. Uh, Megan Veith is our Senior Manager of Policy, Advocacy, and Research at Building Changes, and she's going to give us a little bit of a legislative update for this 2022 session. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I just want to give, provide a quick update. Uh, so legislative session for Washington State ends next week. It is a short session this year. Um, there are a number of housing bills and homelessness bills that are being um, moving, they're moving along. Um, and I wanted to highlight just a couple of them right now. Um, so one of the uh, bills that is moving forward right now is a bill that would really help unaccompanied homeless youth, um, McKinney Venta definition, um, helping them access health care. So we've heard, you know, historically that unaccompanied homeless youth have a lot of um, challenges with accessing healthcare because they don't have a parent or guardian to consent for them. Um, and these, sorry, these are under the age of 18. Um, and this really came to a head, especially with COVID. Um, we had heard from uh, young people and folks uh, working in shelters that a lot of um, young people like were unable to get vaccines or testing, even if they were experiencing symptoms of COVID. And so this bill, um, this session would allow if an unaccompanied homeless youth under the age of 18 is unable to get health care um, through their McKinney Vental Liaison, a school nurse or school counselor, they can consent to the health care themselves. And this is for primary care services. Um, one of the other, and this is a budget item that um, we really are hoping is included in the final budget but it has to do with the Homeless Student Stability Program, which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. Um, this is a program that is uh, between 
the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, OSPI, and the Office of Homeless Youth. Um, and Building Changes helps with this program too. And it really is, the goal is to really connect um, students and families experiencing homelessness with housing services with the ultimate goal of improving education and housing outcomes. And so because it was a short session, we tried to do like a small ask to really um, do some increase in capacity for the Office of Homeless Youth. Um, we're still um, hopeful that it could be in the final budget, but we're really gonna be focusing now more on a bigger um, ask next legislative session. There's also been um, a bill out that has been a really comprehensive, like large bill that's focused on a lot of youth homelessness services. Um, and that's been moving forward. It passed the house um, recently and it is waiting a vote for the final Senate to vote on. Um, and that provides a lot of extra capacity and supports and funding to really, um, really help youth that are experiencing homelessness. Um, and then for some of the final kind of like housing and homelessness asks. So we were really excited to see that the house budget came out with um, a proposal for $100 million for the housing trust fund, which is a fund in Washington state that really goes towards expanding and increasing affordable housing um, for people in Washington state. And so we're really hoping that the final budget will include that in there. That is a historic, would be a historic investment and would really help a lot of families and, um, and, and folks in, in Washington state. Um, and then unfortunately, there are a number of other bills that were focused on homelessness and housing. There was a housing justice bill that would really get at um, discrimination based on criminal records. Um, unfortunately, that didn't move forward this year. Um, there were also some that really helped with tenant protections and eviction reform to kind of continuing a lot of the work that's been happening um, through a lot of advocates and our, and our partners at the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance. Um, but again, this is a, a short session. And so we're really hopeful that next year it's a longer session that we can do a lot more work there. Um, and so those are kind of the updates that I have. Um, the last one I had was around, again, another one around youth housing. So um, the Office of Homeless Youth has an independent youth housing program that really helps a lot of young people who are experiencing homelessness. And so there's also a bill moving forward this year that would really expand that um, to allow more young people eligibility um, for those who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so I think those are kind of all the updates that I have right now, but I'm gonna put my email in the chat if people have any questions. And I know there was some amazing conversations about like wishes to do more policy and advocacy work. So if you have any ideas or like to chat more, please contact me um, and thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. As always, we are so lucky to have you on our team. Um, and willing to pop into all of our training. So thank you. And for all the work you've been doing this session. I'm gonna skip ahead here through our slides, you know, going back and forth. And we are going to go into our networking time. Um, so this is where we are going to break into breakout rooms. Um, and uh, you can continue these discussions that we've been having um, throughout the training with folks who live in similar communities to you. We know that, um, it's not always helpful for rural communities to hear about all the resources that uh, folks who live in cities have. So it, it can be really beneficial to, to talk with folks who are in uh, more similar communities to you um, with uh, different types of resources. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open the breakout rooms and you're gonna have the option at the bottom of your screen to click breakout room and then you'll join the room that you feel like fits the community you are a part of. Um, so let me open those up. Um, and if you are unable to join the breakout room, um, please message me and let me know which room you would like to be put in and I will get you there. Um, we're gonna try and come back at uh, 1157 to wrap things up. Um, and Sammy, I don't think we decided who was going into which room. So um, Megan and Sammy, maybe join whichever room. Kayla's in city, so if you wanna join either of the other two. I can do suburban if you want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. And again, if you are having any issues joining a breakout room, um, please let me know where you would like to be and I can put you there. Um, Sammy, are you able to get in there? Or do you want me to move you? I um, never, maybe I missed it when it prompted me, but I'm going to rural, right? If you re-click on the breakout room button, it should bring that prompt back up for you. Okay. Because it looks like it's trying to have you join, but. Okay, here we go. All right. Thanks, Joey. Yep. See you in a little bit. Bye. All right, welcome back folks as you're joining us here. Um, we've got about 20 seconds before um, um, before everyone's back. Um, Ali, to answer your question, I don't I don't think that watching the recording counts for clock hours. Um, I, yeah, I don't believe so, but maybe someone from OSPI can uh, confirm or deny that one. Um, the situation, uh, Vivian and Melinda, is uh, a misunderstanding on when the training started. Um, so, yeah, I'll let you kind of chat on that, but it looks like we have everyone coming back now. So, um, all right, Ali, there's your answer. Welcome back. Um, we are going to wrap it up here. So, hope you had some great conversations in your breakout room. Um, as you can see, we're hoping to do a last Mentimeter here. So looking for golden nuggets from your breakout room conversations. I look at golden nuggets as what is kind of the piece of your conversation that you're going to carry forward with forward with you. You know, what's that um, what's that golden nugget? So if you can type that in, we're going to see them pop up on the screen. And I think Sammy has one more thing to share while that while you're all typing. I just wanted to make sure, did we get the we get the link for this in there. Oh, it's I will recopy it. It's the same link as before, but I will okay, read got it. it. Sorry. Just trying to drop things in there, couldn't get to it. Um as we're closing up and as we just broke into, you know, your city suburban or um rural rooms, I just wanted to bring up something that I think we didn't get to touch on earlier today. And it's really um specifics around rural communities. And um, what we want to think about is just to really stay open um, to considering what affordable housing could look like, um, specifically when you're living um, in rural communities, because it was highlighted to us in our partnership with OSPI that what we know is that communities are all different. And when we're living, um, we're living in different places, such as maybe you're living in an RV, or maybe you're living in a mobile home, or maybe you're living in a trailer of some kind. Um, a lot of ways that can be a totally viable, um, affordable option, um, but it also can be complicating when we think about eligibility for McKinney-Vento, um, being that you all mostly are coming from schools um, or school-based services. Um, we just wanted to highlight that, um, make sure it was mentioned, um, to just be really, um, you know, always listen to the household student or family that you're working with and um, really be considerate of your landscape as well as your community um, when making those decisions and supporting and um, referring to resources. I did mention in the chat um, just kind of a little extra piece about um, um, after Megan was presenting kind of on the policy side of things, um, we often are also working constantly with unaccompanied homeless youth or youth experiencing homelessness. And um, not only are they not only are they also experiencing housing crisis, but they have very unique situations as well. So oftentimes we have special nonprofits that are able to meet the needs of young people. Um, you know, when you are your own and you're trying to figure out how to graduate and there's different resources that can be offered to you um, or different um, different ways that the school system can help you access medical resources through your McKinney-Vento liaison. Um, we just want to also make sure that we are bringing that up um, before we exit today and we are happy to field any additional questions that may come through. Um, it got a little jumbled um, with timing and we apologize for that. We're super thankful that you all are able to be here with us. All right, so with that, um, we are gonna 
get towards wrapping up, feel free to continue to type in your golden nuggets. Um, we've got some, some great ones up here. I hope you've had a chance to read them. Um, and um, in closing, thanks for joining us today. Um, we There will be a um, post-training survey in PD Enroller. This is important, A, for clock hours. Um, if you are looking for those, you must complete the survey. And B, for us to get feedback as facilitators, um, as we've said, we're doing these trainings multiple times. So any feedback we can receive to um, improve or better meet your needs, um, we want that feedback so we can continue to build these presentations for you. Um, another thing is uh, we have our school housing network um, that you can join. There was a question in the chat about um, kind of that intersection of McKinney-Vento and refugee families. Um, we do have someone from the International Rescue Committee coming to speak with us on March 10th at our network meeting. Um, and that would be a great opportunity to dig a little deeper into that as well as, as our tr uh, future training that we're having in May on um, specific student and family population. Um, so I'll drop a couple links in the chat for that. We are two minutes over, so I'm gonna wrap up. And here's contact info. If you um, have any questions for us at Building Changes or our awesome OSPI team, I'm realizing their homeless ed email did not get saved on this slide. Um, but uh, they are available, as I'm sure you all know, um, as a resource as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and we will see you next time, hopefully.